Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 19. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. I have spent the majority of my life in church, um, as far back as I can remember, we attended one church or another, um, made a decision at an early age that I would serve God however he would use me. My mom never forgot that and prayed me into Bible college. Because I did not want to go to Bible college, I, I had every intention of being the first band note to be a naval officer, and God saw fit to use me in a much better way. So, all my life, pretty much every church I've been in, Palm Sunday, typically has a parade of usually the young ones, marching around the church, waving palm branches. Cassie, come here. Come here. Come on. You are going to be a representative marcher waver. Wave and march, but there and back. Go on, wave and march, wave and march. Wave and march. Fantastic. Thank you, ma'am. You're a good marcher waiver. <laughs> and it always kind of puzzled me because we were celebrating something that, that I just, I, I have a bit of an issue with. Okay? And it really came together for me uh, when Dennis was showing, you move, Dennis. There you are. When Dennis, no, that's not Dennis. Where Dennis go? When Dennis showed uh, one of the Ray Vanderlaan videos in the Brothers Meeting. And Ray Vanderlaan actually put this together in a way that I had never really seen before. And I want to share with you what he shared. Now, I have gone and, and studied quite a bit about what he said because I wanted to make sure that what he was saying was true. My hope is that you guys are just like the Bereans. That what I share with you on Sunday, you go home and check. You hold it up in light of God's word, okay? Because I'm not the ultimate authority. This is, all right? So when I got, when I heard this message, he actually uh, showed it twice. Uh, once because it was part of the series and then once to kind of get our focus on, on, on the particular time of year. And thank you very much for doing that, Dennis. Um, because I'm going to read the passage, and then what I want to share with you today is not your usual Palm Sunday. Okay? We're going to shift our focus a little bit. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 19. And I'm going to start in verse 28. Okay? Now, Jesus is coming from Jericho. Alright? Now, if you look on a map... Jericho is pretty much due east of Jerusalem, correct? Pretty close to due east. And he took the Jericho Road that happens to wander through the same wilderness that we believe Jesus spent his 40 days of fasting in. Okay? So when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, he went into the wilderness, and we believe it was in this general area. So he comes across the Jericho Road, and he's wandering through the area where he had the temptations from Satan. And that road empties out onto the east side of the Mount of Olives. Okay? Now, you're going, okay, what's, what's the point? I'll get there. Because he comes up to the east side of the Mount of Olives, and that's where we're picking up right here. Verse 28. 
And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. That would make sense to me. Somebody shows up at my house and gets in my truck and starts driving. Uh, what are you doing? The Lord needs it. Okay. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> Don't move the seat. It's the Lord. He can put it wherever he wants. <laughs> so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. <clears throat> and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And I'm going to pause there. Because I want to go back and I want to kind of set things up a little bit here. Because see, this is where we tend to stop on Palm Sunday. So Jesus comes up to the top of the Mount of Olives. He sends the two disciples down. They go and borrow the colt of a donkey and bring it to Jesus. And he climbs on the donkey's back and they lead it down and they're, they're laying their coats down. As a matter of fact, um, Luke is the only gospel that doesn't mention the branches. Matthew, Mark, and John all talk about the branches. Matthew talks about the branches of the trees in the area. Mark talks about the branches of the plants that grew in the fields. And John goes so far as to say palm branches, being very specific. Okay? Now you go, why does that matter? It does matter. Because we have to understand historically what's going on here. Okay? We tend to have a unique mindset that everything should be translated through the filter of our understanding. That's a bad place to be. Why? Because we don't understand a lot. Okay? Because Jesus was not operating in Montana, United States of America culture. Okay? So we need to kind of put this thing in place so we can kind of understand what's happening here. Because there's something very significant going on. They go and they get a donkey. Why a donkey? Well, yeah, well, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it gives us a, a, a prophecy about the donkey. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. You know what Zion is, right? The Temple Mount. Okay. Shout aloud. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. <clears throat> your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay? Now, now picture this. This would be like President Obama coming into New York City and driving a Yugo. <laughs> 
Well, uh, he wouldn't really have to drive it. The Secret Service men would probably just pick it up and carry it. Okay? He's not coming in in a limousine. He's coming in in something common. Now, there's an interesting point to this because there's something prophetic in nature in the way this is going on because there's a custom in the East going back to, and, and honestly, I kind of think it might even derive from this passage of Scripture, but I haven't researched far enough back to know because it might exist before this. A king would approach a city in one of two manners, okay? And the way he approached the city, let the city know what his intent was. So if the king came in riding on a horse, he was coming in with power and authority, and he was coming in as a rightful ruler. Now, if you were not on good terms with the king at that point, he was coming against you. All right? The, the horse, you look through scripture, the horse is often referred to as an animal that is related to war and to battle. So when the king rode a horse, when you saw him coming down the road and he's on a horse, you're checking out what's going on because he's probably not real happy with you. Okay? Conversely, if the king came on a donkey, he was coming in peace. He was coming and showing that he was meek. He was not, remember what our definition of meek is. Meek is not weak. It is strength controlled. Because that very same king on the donkey could very easily step off the donkey and get on his horse. Alright? Because, see, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he's riding on a donkey. He's coming meek and lowly. That very same Jesus will be coming back on a horse. Okay? You understand that? He's coming back to war. Donkey is done. Okay? So he's coming in and he's proclaiming peace by the very nature of his approach. Now, here's where things get a little bit complicated. Because this passage even refers in Zechariah, it says, your king is coming. You, you think Jesus was unaware of this passage? Well, no, he wrote it. I mean, he, he inspired it. He understands what's going on. But... He understood fully what that meant. The people around him, including his disciples, did not. Okay? The disciples thought Jesus was coming to establish an earthly kingdom. They thought he was coming, yeah, we're going to Jerusalem. Peter, put in a good word for me. Yeah, <laughs> you on your own. James and John already got his right and left. There's nothing left for us. And they're, they're coming in thinking that he is going to establish an earthly kingdom. Now, as they come down the Mount of Olives, he's riding on a donkey. And did you notice the way that that passage read? It said, as they drew near the city, the multitude of disciples Okay? The multitude of disciples. You need to understand that. How many disciples were there? No. There were probably thousands of disciples. There were 12 apostles. 12 that he chose out of the <coughs> disciples to be his apostles. Those that he would send out as his ambassadors. Okay? So when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he wasn't just walking with, with the 12. There was a multitude that followed him. Why were they following him? They think he's going to Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. And look, let's look at this passage again. Let's look at this, what this is saying here. Verse 36, And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples. Now, multitude kind of gives you an indication it's a little bit more than 12. Okay? Began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. 
They're proclaiming his right to come into the city. They're proclaiming his position. They're proclaiming him to be the Messiah, the Christ. Why is this a problem? Is it a problem? I mean, because right after this, some of the Pharisees of the crowd, they, they said to him, whoa, whoa, whoa. Rebuke your disciples. Okay? There's this loud throng of people proclaiming his glory, and the Pharisees are like, silence them. They gotta be quiet. Now, is this a personal attack against Jesus? Well, I know the Pharisees don't like him. They're already looking for a way to kill him. Are they personally coming against Jesus? I don't think they were. I don't think at this point they were, because you've got to remember, they were still afraid of how the people would respond if they did anything openly against Jesus. Look at some of the things that happened in the temple as he goes into the temple over the coming week. They question him, and he questions them right back. And they're afraid to challenge him to do anything that will set the people against them. Okay? So, I want to share with you a little bit about what's going on here that we don't really see laid out in Scripture. So, why palm branches? Why palm branches? Well, this actually goes back about 160, eh, 200 years. Okay? Back about 168 BC, the Greek, the Hellenistic leader of the time was the, the Seleucids. It was Antiochus IV who titled himself Epiphanes. And they had started Hellenizing the Jews. And that means they were trying to indoctrinate them into the Greek culture. Now, if you ever get the chance to study that, it's absolutely fascinating. Because what happened is, some of the Jews, actually a large portion of the Jews, actually kind of slid in to the Hellenistic thinking. And this is where we actually see the rise of two parties that we see in these next few chapters. It gave rise to the Sadducees, who very much embraced the Hellenistic thinking. And in opposition to the Sadducees were the Pharisees who rose up in opposition, who say, no, 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 no. We are Jews. We are called of God to be separate and distinct. And the Sadducees said, we are separate and distinct. We still keep all the laws that you keep. We just added. About 167 AD, Antiochus passes a law. And he wants the priests to sacrifice pigs. Okay? Well, pigs are unclean animals. They, the, the, the Jews cannot offer that to God. That's an affront. It's a sin. There was a man by the name of Matthias, Matthias Asmonean, <coughs> and he was a priest and he was told to sacrifice the pig. He said, absolutely not. I will not sacrifice the pig. So another priest steps forward to make the sacrifice. Now Matthias goes, uh-uh, and he kills the priest. And this starts what is called the Maccabean Revolt. All right? Now, Matthias had five sons. He and his five sons basically become outlaws at this point. They take off into the wilderness, probably the same area that Jesus just came through. And over the course of seven years, they wage war against the Greeks. And they actually win. They throw the Greeks out. They overthrow the entire Greek army in that area. They basically make it so rough and so miserable that the Greeks go, we don't want it anyway. Okay? Now, this is about 160 AD. Now, what's interesting about this 
It, it, why, why the history? James, I know you appreciate it. <laughs> why the history? It's important because when the Havmanians established the rule back in Jerusalem, they minted coins with this as the emblem for Israel. The palm branch. Okay? This to them was very similar to our American flag. Okay? So the 4th of July, when you see the parade and people are waving their flags back and forth, that's what they're doing. They're celebrating. Hey, hey, hey! We are a unique people! But, but they're stuck because they're under the rule and authority of the Romans. So what, what's going on is they're saying, Hosanna! What does Hosanna mean? It means save! Deliver us! The crowds are calling out for Jesus to come in and reestablish Israel as an independent nation and restore them to the glory of David's kingdom. Okay? This is a very political thing that's going on here. Now, what's going on? Josephus, he's a, a Jewish historian. He wrote several books, um, uh, The Jewish Wars, Jewish Antiquities. In both of those books, he makes mention of the fact that men that wanted to promote themselves as the Messiah would often come up to the Mount of Olives and come down the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> okay, why? Well, we go back to Zechariah, chapter 14. In Zechariah 14... He is speaking about the prophecy of the Messiah that will come. So let's, let's hear what this says. Zechariah chapter 14. Go ahead and turn there if you would. This, this entire passage is about the coming of their Lord, okay, the coming of the Messiah. But I'm only going to pick up verse 4 right here because this is the one that is relevant to what we're talking about. On that day, actually, let's, let's back up to, to verse 3, okay, because this, this will kind of clarify what's going on. The, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. Okay? Now this is taken to be a prophetic scripture about the coming of the Messiah. So men that wanted to be seen as the Messiah. Now don't get me wrong here. Um... The Jews are still looking, and there's still a lot of pretenders. There were pretenders back then, there are pretenders today. Men that declare themselves to be the Messiah, or are declared by others to be the Messiah. Okay? And um, Josephus says that these men would go up to the Mount of Olives in order to fulfill the prophecy, and they would come down. Now, none of them ever split the mountain. Well, neither did Jesus. That's because that's not referencing when he came the first time. It's referencing when he comes the second time. Okay? So, um, these men would go up on the Mount of Olives. They would do it on Passover week. Why? Because that's when most of the Jews were going to be in Jerusalem. Now, you, you look at the size of Jerusalem, especially back then, and you wonder how all of these people were able to get in there. The, the rabbinic tradition is actually that God would adjust space-time to accommodate them. Because when all of the people got together on Passover, they would say that they would be standing shoulder to shoulder in the temple court. And yet when it came time to worship, there was room for all of them to bow down. Okay? Now, just ponder that in your head for a minute. 
So when these men wanted to rise up and rule Israel, even with altruistic notions of, of freeing Israel, they would come down from the Mount of Olives and they would do it on Passover when most of the people were there. Why is it significant for Passover? I mean, there were at least two other days that they were all required to be there. What is Passover? Well, come on Friday and you'll find out. <laughs> I'll give you a little glimpse. Passover is the celebration that God required of them to remember how he had delivered them from bondage and captivity in Egypt. Okay? And he required it to be a week-long festival. Okay? So when the Jews are coming together to celebrate Passover, they already have in mind freedom and deliverance. What a great combination of ingredients to start a revolution. Now, I don't know about you guys. I've only known one person that I knew was predominantly Jewish. And he would talk to me like this. How you doing today, Glenn? And I'd be like, just fine. Space, bubble, you're intruding. And he was loud. And he was loud when he was happy, and he was loud when he was not happy. He was just loud. What we have here is a perfect combination of ingredients to start a rebellion. Okay? And these men knew it. Because the mindset, when there was anyone who was ruling over them, was to free them. Everybody was already thinking it. Freedom. Yay! We're going to be our own people again. So we have prophecy that the Messiah is going to come from the Mount of Olives. He's going to come in and he's going to wage war. He's going to go out against the nations. Now what's really silly is, is they didn't really see that whole prophecy in context, did they? Because if you go back and look at that prophecy, it says that all the nations of the earth are going to be coming against Jerusalem. And Jerusalem's going to be in trouble. And then... The Messiah will appear, and he will destroy all the armies that are encamped against Israel. Okay? So here we have this, this, this dichotomy where the Jews are already prepared for the Messiah to come at Passover because they're already thinking about this. And people taking advantage of that would gather about themselves some people, and they'd get up on the Mount of Olives, and they'd come in, and the people would start proclaiming this guy is the Messiah. Hey, he's done great things. Hey, he's led us well. Hey, he's going to deliver you. <laughs> wow, they're kind of fragile. <laughs> okay. So let's jump forward. Back to where we started. Jesus has just come from Jericho, goes through Bethany. We see in Bethany, he's anointed. We see Judas's heart at that point. Whoa, master, this is expensive perfume. We could take that and sell it and make lots of money to give to the poor. Okay? And Jesus is coming in. Now, does Jesus know what's going on? Yes, he does. Matter of fact, he's already told his disciples multiple times, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And they don't get it. I mean, he has already told them, leaving from Caesarea Philippi, Remember at Caesarea Philippi, where he said, I'm going to establish my kingdom on this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that. And then he determined from that point, I am going to Jerusalem, and there I will die and be raised again. And they heard, we're going to Jerusalem. Yay! And then they inserted, and he's going to be king. Yay! And we're going to rule with him. Yay! Let's go. I got shotgun. 
Only room for one on the donkey. So they come down. They come from Jericho. They go to Bethany. They go up the Mount of Olives. Jesus sends them down to hijack some guy's donkey. Well, really, you think about that. He's not hijacking it because it's his donkey anyway, isn't it? They bring the donkey. They put cloaks on it. Now, now think about it. If there were just 12 disciples and they were putting their cloaks all the way down, they'd have to be doing like this mad rush. As soon as the donkey passes over one, they've got to pick it up and run it to the front. Okay? So we know there were lots of people with him. And can you imagine standing in Jerusalem and looking up at the Mount of Olives and seeing this multitude of people coming down and they're, they're quiet until they draw near to Jerusalem and then they start celebrating and proclaiming the glories of what he had done? I mean, think about this. Think of some of the things that they had seen. The dead raised to life. Yeah, yeah. You know, Lazarus that fed us, he used to be dead. Really, seriously, like dead. For four days in the grave. Feeding of 4,000. Oh, and feeding of 5,000. The lame are healed, the blind see, the mute speak. The people that are possessed are delivered and set free. He's got quite a few things that they can celebrate, right? And they're going in to establish a kingdom where this guy that does incredible, powerful things is going to rule. Jesus sitting on a donkey. I'm going to Jerusalem. Do they? I don't know. How do you do steer donkeys? I don't know how you steer them. Especially ones that have never been read, ridden. How, how, they, they don't know what to do. So he's going, I'm going, I'm going to sit on a throne. All the people are praising me. I've done some cool stuff. Let's jump back to Luke and see his response. Okay? Back in Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> so the Pharisees, they say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now, let, let me clarify my point. Why do I think that they were not having a personal agenda at Jesus, against Jesus at this point? Because prior to this, and even after this event, these false messiahs would come, and they would gather people about them, and they'd move down toward Jerusalem. And people would get excited, and people would get loud, and they would think that they were going to have freedom. So they would start being boisterous, rowdy. And the Romans didn't like boisterous and rowdy. We, we know of one example that Josephus cites where uh, more than 600 men came down against Jerusalem, and of the 600, 400 were slaughtered outright. The other 200 were taken captive. Okay? Rome had a very simple and direct way of dealing with threats. Kill it. Overwhelm it and kill it. Okay? Worked pretty good for them. They controlled a lot of the earth. So, during the Passover season, having been familiar with what is going on, the history of this time, Rome would actually bring in extra soldiers to keep the peace. Now, knowing about this riot, I think the Pharisees were coming and trying to get Jesus to quiet everybody down so there wouldn't be another slaughter the week of Passover. I, I don't think they're really after Jesus personally at this point. They wouldn't have the audacity to stand up in front of his disciples. I mean, they're still afraid of what the disciples will do to them. I think they're trying to keep peace in the city so the Romans don't come out and ruin everything. Oh, yeah. He also came in on a very important day. 
Does anybody know what day Jesus actually arrived? Why that's significant? It was Lamb Selection Day. When God established the Passover, uh, flip open to Exodus chapter 12 real quick. I want to establish this real quick in your minds. Because nothing Jesus did was accidental. Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, I'm starting in verse 1, in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. See, they, this was Lamb Selection Day. When the Israelites would come in and they would choose the lamb that was going to be offered for sacrifice. Now, do you think it's coincidental that Jesus came in on this day? No. See, way back in Exodus, God had established, he already knew what the plan was. I think God actually chose that day for lamb selection because he's already chosen that day for the lamb that was already selected. Okay? So, Jesus comes in. We see them saying, hey, hey, you've got to tone things down, man. Things are going to get riotous out here. We can't have that. And he says, I tell you the truth. If they're quiet, the rocks will cry out. And there we see the start of rock music. <laughs> Very good. One for you. But what happens here? Does Jesus come in celebrating? Verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set a, bar a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, it it's interesting because... <coughs> The weep here, this is the only time that we see in all of Scripture where this word in the Greek is used to describe Jesus crying. Okay? And this word literally means he wailed. And actually, the, the emendation to this word actually means that he was crying specifically for someone. Every sign of overt and, or external grief was being displayed by him at this time. Here's all the people, man. They're cheering. They're shouting. They're celebrating. They're dancing. They're waving palm branches. And Jesus is wailing and weeping. Why? Because he knows that they don't get it. They don't understand why he's there. They're looking for an earthly Messiah who will deliver them unto a Davidic kingdom, not an eternal Messiah who will right their relationship with God and deliver them from sin. And he is grieving for them because they're lost. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Back a few chapters, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and it says Jesus wept. You know, we have the same thing, the same word in the English, he wept. But the, the Greek word there is not wailing, 
The, the, the Greek word there means he shed a tear. <clears throat> he shed a tear. It's quiet. But here he is grieving <coughs> out loud and wailing. <coughs> See, Jesus is looking forward to what's to come. But he's not looking forward just to the cross. He's looking forward to the empty tomb. And he knows that God's salvation is here. And the people don't get it. The people are looking for what earthly benefit they can get from him. Give us more food! Heal our sick! Raise our dead! <clears throat> now, now talk about raising the dead. <clears throat> when Jesus arose, he didn't arise alone. The tombs were open and all of the righteous people got up and walked around. Did you know that? That's in Scripture. We'll talk about that next week. This week, he is wailing before God. He is wailing to his Father. He is wailing on behalf of the lost. Now think about this for a moment. Because who is he surrounded by? His disciples. Even them are not getting this. Well, I think a lot of them did. We see that in Acts. A lot of them got it. You know, when somebody rises from the dead, you tend to pay attention. <coughs> so Palm Sunday. <coughs> Jesus comes in to Jerusalem. And the people are excited. Man, they're stoked. They're bouncing up and down. They're shouting his praises. They're telling everybody the incredible things he's done. He's getting ready to go into the temple. Matter of fact, the very next verses talk about him going into the temple and cleaning it out. <coughs> He's looking to the coming week when the betrayer will make himself known. He'll be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now think about that for a minute. He's betrayed into the hands of sinners. Who took him? The priests. The ones that he had chosen out of all of Israel, whom he had chosen out of all the people of the world, to serve him. And he's betrayed into their hands. That's something that you should always be mindful of. God resists the proud. Why? Because at some point, they cease to look at him and begin to look at themselves. And all of a sudden, there's this race to somehow become equal to God, either by making more of ourselves than we are or making less of him than he is. Okay? And that's exactly what happened to the priests. They had it all figured out. It's got to work like this. And when someone came up against them, they took care of business because it wasn't going the way they had planned. Jesus coming down from the Mount of Olives knows this. Now, is he grieving for himself? I don't think so because he's not talking about himself here. He's grieving because he knows in about 40 years, little less, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Rome is actually going to set up a wall around Jerusalem so nobody can get out and they will go in and destroy Jerusalem. And the majority of the population will be slaughtered. And Israel will cease to be an independent nation. Until when? 1948. 1948. Which he also prophesied about. So don't worry about it. But he's grieving for his people. He's grieving for their lack of understanding. So Palm Sunday, we come together. We're waving ours, our palm branches. We're singing Hosanna. But we need to keep in mind what it is we are singing 
about. We are singing about the deliverer of our souls. The one that has given us his righteousness that we stand perfect and pure before God. That our sin is completely washed away, accounted for, gone and removed from us. And that king will come one day. He will come back and he will be on the Mount of Olives. And it will split in two, moving north and south. And he will come as a warrior to wage war against all who oppose him. And we're going to be there with him. And we will see the might of God unleashed against everybody that has forsaken him, has rejected him, has rejected his free gift of salvation. Don't feel bad for them. God has presented everyone with a choice. What about those that don't have Bibles? Read your Bible. He explains it in there. Okay? We have got to fix in our minds the purpose of this week. We talked last week about bunnies and chocolate eggs and painted Easter eggs and things like that. Are those okay to do? Could be. Could be absolutely fine. Also could not be. Kind of depends where you're at. Because if that's what Easter is to you, then it's not okay. If Easter is the celebration of the Savior that has risen from the grave, the first fruits from the dead, now there have been other people raised from the dead, but they died again. Jesus was the only one that went dead and came up to live forevermore. That is our proof that we also will live eternally. Okay? That's our hope. So we have salvation given on the cross. We have the proof in the resurrection that what he said he had done was done. Rejoice. The cost was great, but the price is paid. <clears throat> Father, we bless you today. We thank you, Lord God, that you saw fit, looking down through the ages, to make a way for us to be restored to you. Father, for us to come home, for us to be restored to a rightful relationship, a rightful place in you. Father, we thank you for the free gift of salvation, for your grace that is so rich, for your mercy. Father, for your perfect forgiveness. I ask, Father, that you would help us to live our lives in such a way that they would be a testimony to everything that you have done for us. Help us, Father, to be mindful that we represent you all the time. Not just here at church, Father, but at work, around our co-workers, in the grocery store, even at home, where so often we let our guard down Help us, Father, to be mindful that your grace is for all time, and we all time represent you. <clears throat> Help us to have our hearts and our minds fixed on you. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>